Marvin Harrison Jr. is forging his own path as he transitions from college to the NFL, and it's a path that others are likely to follow. We explore that with ESPN's Josh Weinfuss. Plus, Tom Brady got roasted, and the Kentucky Derby notched a huge viewership number and a new media deal. It's Tuesday, May 7th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Tom Brady got roasted on Sunday on a Netflix special. Actually, as is common practice at roast, everyone involved got a pretty brutal takedown, namely Bill Belichick, Gronk, and Robert Kraft. Brady's divorce from Giselle, Belichick's inability to find a coaching job, Gronk's general childlike demeanor, and plenty more was fair game. There was one joke that crossed the line for Brady, which was won by comedian Jeffrey Ross, who took a crack at salacious allegations against Robert Kraft, at which point Brady actually came up to Ross on stage mid-roast and told him to stop. The event is another entry in Netflix's list of made-for-TV sports-adjacent shows, but it's also worth thinking about what's in it for Brady as he gets ready to become Fox's lead analyst for their NFL broadcasts. If there's a knock on Brady before he's started the job, other than that he's never done it before, it's that he's too stiff. Other than the moment with Ross, this was him being the opposite of that and having a lot of fun with it. For Belichick, it's a similar story, but replaced stiff with curmudgeonly. The coach, who is also looking toward a future in media, showed he can be a funny curmudgeon, which could provide a good counterweight on the Manning cast and the Pat McAfee show, where he's expected to be a regular. Just before its 150th running, the Kentucky Derby announced a new media deal, which will keep it on NBC through 2032. Once the Derby has a media partner, it likes to stick with it. NBC has had the race since 2001, taking over from ABC, which had it from 1975 to 2000. Before that, CBS had the Derby from 1952 to 1974. By the end of this deal, the Kentucky Derby will have been on television for 80 years, with only two switches and broadcasters in that time. The new deal also includes the Kentucky Oaks and Derby Oaks, which will spread programming between NBC, Peacock, the USA Network, and NBCU platforms. While it famously only lasts two minutes, the Derby is a valuable media property. The race coverage averaged 16.7 million viewers and had over 20 million at its peak. It helps that the event is something of a Met Gala for sports fans, with athletes and celebrities everywhere you look, all in outlandish outfits. The race itself is just the garnish in the mint julep. All right, I am joined now by ESPN reporter Josh Weinfuss. Welcome, Josh. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. So Marvin Harrison Jr., fourth overall pick in the NFL draft, selected by the Arizona Cardinals, has not signed the NFLPA's group licensing agreement, but according to your reporting, has a separate deal with Fanatics. So what's he up to here? Yeah, so before his last season at Ohio State, which was his junior year, he signed a a contract with Fanatics that's worth more than a million dollars, and it's a uh, just for memorabilia, so autographs, uh, autograph trading cards, uh, game worn stuff, and there are other marketing uh, parts to this as well. But he signed that, and now he wants to renegotiate for more money. Obviously, being the fourth overall pick, he probably believes he's worth more than whatever he got uh, as going to his junior year of college. So that's where that's at right now. He has, you know, not being part of the GLA prohibits his jersey from being made by Nike, which means Fanatics can't sell that or any other um, outlet uh, as well. You know, he, and he, the NFLPA has negotiated with about 80, 85 companies to use their uh, players' name, image, and likeness uh, as part of the GLA, and he can't be part of any of those. So any deal he signs right now is a individual one-off. So he has a deal with New Balance, which uh, would not have been part of the GLA anyway, because most players will sign their, their shoe deals as a, you know, an, an individual contract. Um, he also has to deal with uh, head and shoulders. He was in an ad for them, uh, this past week. So he has two ads, two deals on his own, uh, technically three if you count the fanatics. Um, but he's trying to renegotiate the fanatics deal, uh, according to a source in order to make more money. He's trying to use the GLA as leverage. But I think when you get into the nitty gritty here, you realize they're two separate things, right? What he did, what he signed with Fanatics isn't something that he would get with a GLA. Yeah, this is interesting. So is, are all those like, you know, 80 plus deals that the GLA kind of bundles together? Um, is he trying to recreate a bunch of those on his own? Like, is it, does it seem like he's going to sign some, like the GLA itself or a GLA like deal eventually so that, people can buy his jersey the way they can with everyone else? Or does it seem like 
he's really just going to keep forging his own path here. That's still yet to be seen. Uh, it sounds like he eventually will sign the GLA, but for now, he's forging his own path. But what's interesting, though, is that it sounds to me, after talking with quite a few people about this, that the NFLPA ultimately would love to see their players sign individual deals instead of being group marketed because they can individually make more money. Obviously, it'll hurt the low end of that scale, the players who you know don't have the marketability and won't get those big deals who earn, I think the, the average payout last year, which might go up a little bit this year, is about $30,000 as a baseline to every player. And obviously you're going to have some like the Patrick Mahomes and that that tier of NFL players going to get more because of, of their deals um, and, and their marketability. But the NFLPA, I think, ultimately would love to see players sign individual contracts with companies. So do I think that's going to happen with Marvin Harrison Jr.? No, I think he might get maybe a couple more one-offs, but I think ultimately he'll eventually sign the GLA when is a question. Yeah, and I mean, 30000 is it's pretty low for an NFL player. I mean, a single deal, like a single head and shoulders commercial, I would think would, would get you more than that. And so um, it doesn't feel like he's giving up a whole lot other than the sort of, you know, he might have fans who are annoyed that they can't get his jersey the way they can get anyone else's. But in terms of, of money, I, I'm wondering what the GLA has to offer someone of his stature or the many players who are more famous than him. So that's one of the questions that I've been trying to answer. And my the one thing I've been trying to figure out is, let's take j- jersey sales, for example. Like, if he had signed the GLA and his, sale went, his jersey went up for sale on Fanatics or wherever it was, the, day, the moment he got drafted, like, what cut of that would he have received? And what would it look like? financially compared to let's say the 30,000 that's still an answer a question that I have not been able to answer yet uh no one seems to want to part ways with that little tidbit of of data um but I think you know the one thing that we have seen obviously we saw Caitlin Clark's jersey sell out the moment she was drafted we saw Kayla Williams uh his jersey sell out and he broke Caitlin Clark's record so there's obviously some money that he's leaving on the table by not being part of the GLE I just don't know Compared to what he's making otherwise, what are, you know, is it worth it? Is it not worth it? Where does that stack up? In terms of the GLA itself, I mean, it sounds like if the NFLPA, which is negotiating this in the first place, wants more players to break off and that just becomes a more standard practice, I wonder if we're at some point going to see more wholesale changes to the GLA, if that's still a thing, to make it more worth it for players to opt in. We could. We absolutely could. Right now, the GLA needs six players uh, to negotiate a deal. So anything less than six, you can't, uh, market them as a group license. So I think they'll always have six at some point, somehow down, you know, as part of the, the NFLPA, because there are a lot of players who probably cannot get deals on their own just because of name stature and, you know, all that stuff. So I, I do think that we will see more players eventually break off. I think this is, it's kind of, um, it's a, it's a it's a security blanket, right? For guys who feel like they might not be able to get those deals, they're still going to have some money coming in being part of the GLA. Um, but like I, like I said, like, you know, we could see eventually guys sign one-offs with Pepsi, with, you know, uh, Old Spice, whatever it may be. But I think one question that I'm still trying to answer as well is like, can a player sign an indiv- individual deal with Nike to make their jersey, which could then be marketed to all these, you know, retail outlets and they could be sold that way that's that's one of the other questions i'm still trying to get answered yeah i mean it feels like on one hand this is you know a player being proactive and maybe putting in a little extra work to make some extra money and taking advantage of new opportunities that are sort of more familiar to us in the nil world at the same time it it seems like it could be a huge pain for a lot of people and companies involved if it's, it turns into something where everyone just takes the best deal they can get. I could see that as well. I mean, if you look at it from the standpoint of let's keep talking Nike, right? If every player is trying to sign an individual deal with Nike, would Nike even want to do that? You know, do they want to sign however many players there are or however many jer- players' jerseys they sell? Because obviously they don't sell, you know, all 53 jerseys on a roster. You know, so whatever the number looks like, do they want to have that many individual contracts? Or do they just want to say, hey, guys, to make our life easier, we're going to go to the NFL PA. So if you want your jersey made, you have to sign with the NFL PA. I think both sides have leverage here. Um, so it'll be interesting how that plays out. 
So Harrison is someone where this is not the first time he's done things a little differently from everyone else. I mean, namely, he skipped the combine and pro day. Um, and it was something where first I was thinking, you know, why is he doing that? Is, you know, he, he turning down money? Is he making life harder for himself? Um, but then with him, you think about it a little longer. And it's like, well, why don't more players do that? I mean, like, what did Caleb Williams stand to gain from going to the combine? Everyone knew he was going to be the first overall pick. So, yeah, I'm wondering if he's, you know, he's charting a path in, in a few different ways that other players might walk down behind him. Yeah, so I think in this case, he's definitely forging his own path. And I think he is going to lay the groundwork, or he has laid the groundwork for other players to follow. And and here's why. So something I wrote about on Saturday. When the top of the draft order was solidified after the regular season was over, his father, who's a Hall of Fame receiver Marvin Harrison Sr., um, looked at kind of, you know, the top four, five, six picks. And they said, all right, Caleb Williams probably going number one to Chicago. Number two, Washington's probably going to draft a quarterback. Number three, New England's probably going to draft a quarterback. So the earliest that uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. could go is four with to the Arizona Cardinals because they already have a quarterback. They weren't in the market for a quarterback. So by kind of assessing that, they were like, all right, we know he's not going top three. Earliest is four. He's probably not going to fall out of the top five or six. They said, why do we need to put his body through all these, uh, all this training, all these workouts to get his body ready to run these drills that have nothing to do with football like they do with the combine and then keep preparing for the pro day. And obviously he's going to you know, go on some interviews. So he's going to be flying cross country, all this stuff. So they decided, you know what? We're going to shut it down. He obviously didn't play in his bowl game. So his last, his last football was, I think, like late November, like November 25th, that or right around that time when Ohio State played Michigan. So he hasn't played football since then. And, you know, obviously he didn't do it, like I said, didn't do the combine, didn't do the pro, bay, all, pro, uh, pro day all strategically to save his body. And now Marvin Harrison's saying that his body feels as good as it's felt in a long time. And the advantage he's going to have when the Cardinals report to rookie minicamp uh, this coming weekend is – He's going to be the rare rookie, maybe one of, I mean, I can't even count how few of, of players this, this this applies to, one of the few rookies to ever have a true offseason. Because guys, once their season's over, their college season, they are into combine training, they're into pro day training, they're into interviews. I mean, he went on two top 30 interviews. So, sure, he was in Indy to do all the medicals, do the interviews. He didn't have a pro day, and then he went on two fights. Right. Like his body is as fresh as probably it's been in a long time. And that's going to give him the advantage in the regular season uh, when that begins in September. And then, you know, like everyone talks about the rookie wall. So he thinks he's not going to hit it. Some of the Cardinals coaches I've talked to think, you know, that of course he will hit it because he's never played in a 17 game season plus a three preseason games. Like there will be some adjustment, but he, his body won't be as fatigued come November, December, January as much as other players who went through that whole process will be. And back to the question, I do think we're going to see other players do this. You know, I think players who know they're going in the top 10, like you said with Caleb Williams, what, what do they need to prove going forward, right? If they know that they're a lock for the top 10, go to Indy, they'll do the medicals, they'll do the interviews. They don't need to show anybody anything else besides what's on tape. So I do think we're going to see more of that going forward. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Josh Weinfuss, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. That's it for today. Drop us a rating or review wherever you like to tune in and make sure you're subscribed to the show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.